We continue our study of uh, God, remember, study of God in the life of Abram. And I really did not finish uh, verses uh, 7, uh, chapter 12, I didn't finish verses 7 through 8 last week. And I want to read to you beginning at verse 6, and I will read through the end of chapter 12. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of as far as the site of uh, the tree of Morah at Shechem. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel. Pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Nega. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while, because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sisters, that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. And they sent him on his way with his wife and everything that he had. Now, just a little bit about these altars. Abram built an altar. You see that in verse 7. The altar in the Old Testament signify your relationship to God that God had established with you. Altars were built to commemorate, to remember some very moving, very meaningful, very promising thing that God had done in your life. In Abraham's case, it is this. I am going to give your descendants your offspring, this land. And God has already described the two things that make this humanly impossible. Number one, Abram has no offspring. He's at least 75 and maybe a little bit older. And we know Sarah, it is impossible for her to bear children. Secondly, the land is controlled by the Canaanites the most powerful people in that region. God doesn't give uh, Abram some open land, some free land, like, you know, we had here in Iowa way back in the 1800s. Here it is, take it. This land belonged to the Canaanites where you have the giants, you have great, powerful, walled cities, and God says to Abram, I'm going to give this to you. Abram builds an altar. That altar means God 
I believe what you say. I trust your word. An altar also points us to Jesus. Because you and I cannot come to God in our sinful nature, we always come to God through Jesus. Abram, same way. There would need to be a sacrifice placed on that altar. Because every man, every woman, every child in the world knows God. Well, maybe I better say it this way. Knows there is a God. According to Romans 1, those whom God has not chosen, they suppress that knowledge of God. They don't want God in their life. All kinds of efforts are made for them. Secular education is designed to remove a child's understanding of God. The evolutionary model is designed to remove God. Your and my life in the culture we live is a humanistic culture. Man determines what is right. Man determines what is wrong. And woe to you if you're going to insert the sanctity of life and protect life in, in, in the state of Texas today. Do you see that? These who fight against that law to protect life really confirm Romans chapter 1. Man's sinful niche and every one of us is there until the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, changes our hearts, changes our eyes, changes our ears, so that we hear, and we understand, and we see, and we perceive the Kingdom of God. I want to say this. There's nobody sitting here that became a sinner. You and I were conceived. You and I were born in sin. It is God who comes and raises the dead. Huh? He's the one who has brought life, joy, peace, forgiveness, health, strength, joy, peace in our life. Abram experiences that and he builds an altar. You and I, same thing. That altar marked Abram's home as God's territory. Your and my home, I hope, is marked this is God's territory. What's hanging on to your walls, what materials you're reading, how you live your life is a marker. That's Abraham. Then he moves and he dwells between Bethel and Ai. You know, why don't they move into Bethel? Why don't they move into Ai and give Sarah a break? He's living in tents. Lives in tents all of his life. 
because Abram is called out from the culture, and all of these cultures are humanistic. They're all secular. And God says, you leave. And so he and Sarah and Lot and the possessions they have, they are living between Bethel and Ai. And what does he do? He builds an altar. Got that? Now we go into this famine where it says, now there was a famine in the land. How do you explain famine? Whose famine is this? And you'd all raise your hand and say, it's God's. Because all things are made through Christ. Without him, nothing has been made that has been made. Agree? This famine is in God's will, in God's, for God's glory, for God's praise. That scroll that God hands to Jesus in Revelation 5 is not something that happens ages and ages later from creation. It is handed to Christ because he is to carry out the will of God beginning in Genesis 1, 1. This famine in Abram's life, about 2,000 years after creation, is in Abram's life. For who? Who is the famine for? Number one, it's for God, for his glory, to reveal himself. The only way you and I know God is by his work. The only way I know you, God, is by your work. The only way you know me, I know you by your work. And by the way, I'm very happy to know you. I'm very impressed with you. But each one of us is revealing ourselves every day, every moment, by our work. What do we do? What's important to me? What do I worship? I'm revealing. God's famine, same as that storm that Jesus Christ is in the boat with the disciples. And the disciples wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care, we're gonna die? And Jesus calms the storm, and the disciples are more scared of Jesus than of the storm. It was Jesus' storm in the first place to reveal to the disciples, I'm king of creation, all things belong to me. Every molecule in this universe is under my authority. If there was one molecule not under Christ's authority, under God's sovereignty, none of God's promises could be trusted. And then you better be looking for another God. God says, my purpose stands. Jesus says, I have all authority. Not only is this uh, famine for God, it's for Abram. It's for Sarah. It's for Lot. It's for Pharaoh. It's for Pharaoh's uh, officials. It's for the Egyptians. This is not God saying, oh my goodness, here's a famine. What can I do about it? God says, there's a famine. This is my will, my purpose, and I'm going to be glorified. And bring me to say that before the sermon ends. And there are no little kids here, right? So I can go a little bit longer. Is that a problem? <laughs> anyway, 
you have here that uh, you have this famine. And so they go, as he was about to enter Egypt, he says to his wife, Sarah, I know, uh, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Every wife is loving that statement, right? She is 60s, close to 70 maybe. She's beautiful. And uh, I said this at Kyle's wedding, but it wasn't original to me. I heard it from another preacher who said to this groom at his wedding, he says, your wife is really beautiful. And I'd like to see her 40 years from now looking beautiful because of your love, because of your care, because of your protection, because of how you have treated her and protected her for 40 years. She's beautiful. I think, but you maybe have to shake, shake some salt on this because we're going to read about Abram uh, right away, but I think Abram was a good husband. I know they were wealthy. She had servants. She didn't have to you know, work at the scrub board. And she wasn't working at the meat board cutting stuff and she wasn't butchering chicken. She had a good life. She also had no children. She never bore a child. Those are two pretty good things to think about. Now, as we continue to go on here, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Smart Abram, he's thinking ahead. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Possibility? Really good possibility. Because the Egyptians, I have to throw this in with you too, Egyptian men, does anybody here have an Egyptian heritage? Nobody? But this is on the internet. Egyptian men believed Egyptian women were not as attractive as a foreign woman. Abram knew that. And so he's just putting all of his ducks in a row. I'm going to save myself. And so he says, uh, say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Any problems, ladies? <laughs> you know what? Abraham did not lie. You go to Genesis chapter 20. Abram says, she is my sister. He's saying this to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. She is my sister. She is a daughter of my father, but not a daughter of my mother. So they're half. Isn't that what you say? That's a half-sister, right? But he kind of dropped the word half, and he doesn't mention anything about being my wife. And so what he's saying to Sarah, I don't protect you. I won't protect you. Take off your ring. We're not married. I have to save my life. Let's go on. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. And when the Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. I want you to be clear. There is a, oh, the word slips my mind. There was a cleansing um, ceremony process so that before Sarah can sleep with Pharaoh, it's about a six-month process. The word is purification. That's what it is. That's God's wonderful way of protecting Sarah from being, uh, being adulterated by Pharaoh. 
Remember the dragon in Revelation is in front of the woman waiting to devour her child, Christ. That's what you see happening here. It happens all the time through the Old Testament, by the way, but I want to bring it out to you. If Sarah would have had a relationship with Pharaoh, there would be no way that we would know if Isaac is from, or Ishmael, whoever, is from Sarah. See? God protects. God controls. And there is nothing happening here in Genesis 12 that God is scratching his head and said, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? How, you know, Abram, I hope you open your eyes and change. That's not how it is. God knows every day of Abram's life, Sarah's life, Pharaoh's life, and it is all the way of righteousness. Hang on to that. David says in Psalm 23, old man, looking back at his life, he says, you lead me in paths of righteousness. He doesn't say, you lead me in paths of righteousness sometimes. It is a constant God leading. And all of the sins in your life and my life are, they're not righteousness, but they're the path of righteousness. What David learned in in, in, in his relationship to Bathsheba was a, he says, you restore the joy of my salvation. He never lost his salvation. Didn't have any joy in it because of his sin. You restore the joy of your salvation. I will teach sinners your ways. He doesn't have to read a book. Say, let's see how does God's grace work and how does his mercy work. David knew it. I'm restored. I am brought back. I love you, Lord. God doesn't rip 73 Psalms out of the Bible because of David's past. David is the evidence, as every redeemed sinner is the evidence of God's grace and God's mercy. Okay, I, I will try to put this to an end here right away. Now, but the Lord, oh, by the way, these sheep and cattle and male and female donkeys and so on are the bride price. Pharaoh is an upright man. He respects Abram and his sister, and he says, here is the bride price. Sarah is mine, and Abram says, she's yours. That's how bad it was. God, never frustrated, his word, but, it's a big, important word, inflicted, the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh. We don't know what they were, but they were serious. And his household, because of Abram's wife, Sarah, and then this mysterious verse, 18, so Pharaoh summoned Abram, what have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? How did Pharaoh find that out? We believe Sarai is not in Pharaoh's palace with a clear conscience. She's guilty. And she senses my being here is the cause of God's judgments on Pharaoh and his family, and we believe that she told Pharaoh, I am his wife. <coughs> Isn't that amazing? Now I know what's going on in your head. God, this isn't fair. 
Pharaoh did everything by the book. It is Abram who's guilty. Gil after Abram. So, my brothers and sisters, why does God go after Abram? I mean, after Pharaoh. And Abram is scot-free, am I right? Well, God's revealing himself. Abram and Pharaoh are both sinners. God doesn't think saints in the Old Testament, New Testament, as saintly, he paints them as they really are needing Christ's redemption. The only difference between Pharaoh and Abram is this. God's covenant. You know the verse. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. You could go this way, Abram I have loved, Pharaoh I have hated. God protects his people. Think of all the times we put ourselves into dangerous situations. And God orchestrates everything. And we get out of it with our tail between our legs. And we say, God, you're so merciful. You're so loving. That's what this is. And God takes a and Sarah and locked out of this sinful thing they are in with all of these possessions, all the bride price, I will bless you, God says, and they come back to each. Cute story, right? Where is Jesus in this storm? Because Jesus said, that day of resurrection, these two guys walking to Emmaus, and he began to teach them from Moses and the prophets. There are two people in this passage who symbolize Christ. And it's not Abel, it's Sarah. Sarai lays her life down for Abram's life. She loves Abram. The other one is Pharaoh. In all of his authority, king of Egypt, he could have had Abram's head chopped off. He rebukes Abram. He shows grace to Abram. And Abram is restored to his wife. And they together come back to Egypt. And I sort of wonder what the conversation was. <laughs> God, how good you are. You lead me. You guide me. And you know that in your own life, but I know it in my life. May God bless his word to us. Amen. Father, we are so blessed how you save Abel, Sarah, Lot. They are so helpless like we are. May we 
by your spirit just be blessed to know you love you know that we owe our whole life to you and that we worship and glorify you not only here but every moment of our life in jesus name amen